those cars roll out bright and shiny now in this session and just correcting something that Mark and I mentioned a little bit earlier in the day that uh, in the original regulations this next, pr next practice session was exclusively for co-drivers but it's actually for all of the drivers who got amended during the week. The cars are at 45 degrees about to go out for what is going to be a very important practice session now in preparation for the Armour All Top 10 shootout this afternoon. So a couple of different programs depending on who you are and what your requirements are. Final opportunity to trim the car or get it right for the shootout. Notice the flags in the background. It's a 20 odd kilometre an hour southeasterly. That will affect the cars for sure. Session's gone green now as they get underway for practice number seven. It's been a very busy week at Mount Panorama. There's already been a lot of trauma up here. There are nine sets of those Dunlop harder of the two option tyres available this weekend. Seven compulsory stops in the race, which means eight segments. And that excludes any unusual or unplanned stops. And there's always going to be the possibility of weather. And in fact, there may well be later on this afternoon as well. Our racetrack, famous around the world. 6.213 kilometres around here with an average speed of about 180 kilometres an hour with a top speed of 300 kilometres per hour. The cars are travelling at more than 80 metres with every passing second when they make their way down Conrod Strait. It's relatively gentle on brakes, but you've got to manage brake temperatures front and rear very carefully to get optimum performance at this place. It's got the fastest corner in Australian motorsport, one of the fastest in the world when they get down to the chase. It's only a very short, sharp run with very tall gearing in the cars, tallest gearing that they use anywhere during the year to get them off the line and down to turn one, it's 225 metres. And then you start this magnificent climb all the way to the cutting where the gradient increases to one in six and then grabbing fourth gear over the top at Reed Park, bombing down into what we describe as the metal grate, Sulman Park, Reed Park, and building speed towards McPhillamy. And then trying to keep the car settled. Mark Scaife joins me in the commentary box. You've generated pole positions and victories are plenty at this location. Doesn't matter how many times you go around it, even if it's just <laughs> in an old rental car at 60 kilometres an hour, we love it. Exactly. We just saw Craig Lowndes in the 1969 version of the Monaro enjoying it. So. I'm 100% with you, Crompo. It's a fantastic layout, and the character of the place is unsurpassed. And it's almost signature aspect is this big, long straight. Conrod straight, 300 kilometres an hour through that big, fast right-hander, and then having to get it slowed for the change of direction at the chase down to the final corner at Murray's Corner. And one of the things about this place, and we always talk about it, is the elevation change and the weirdness in terms of the way that the rise and fall works and how much as a driver you have to run the car on those angles to use the camber of the road to make the car flow and in this session not only will we see some cars start the session with higher fuel loads and trying to get ourselves organized to get a specification for the race tomorrow it's the last hit out for a lot of the guys in terms of the way that you want the car, you, you, you want to work away at making the car easy to drive. Conversely, we know that we've got the top 10 shootout this afternoon and there will be rehearsals of plenty given the number of tyres that you made reference of before. Nine sets of the harder compound tyre. One of the things that happens around this place is because it's a public road, it changes character immensely. The amount of rain we had last night has washed the circuit, and it'll be very interesting to see what the grip level is now. And we've only bumped up the air temperature by two degrees since the earlier practice session. It was nine when they started. It's only 11 out there at the moment. Feels like six degrees, and currently got 22 kilometres an hour from the southeast, which is a crosswind coming down Conrod Strait effectively gives them a tailwind as they make their way up pit straight. You can see the trees are a bit more lively in the background now than they've been at any point during the weekend. Exit turn two, Blundstone Bend on the run up to the cutting. It's a blind approach past the rock face here and then back to second gear. You can see the dip in the road and there's that wind that I spoke about. Now, the Bureau was suggesting that from one o'clock there was the possibility of light showers through the afternoon. And depending on where you look in the district at the moment from the I Can Quit Chopper, you'll see some parts of the horizon are darker than others. They're talking about still some percentage chance of a thunderstorm, believe it or not. Now, we had some wet weather yesterday. They could certainly use some rain in this part of the world. The drought conditions west of the Great Dividing Range in Australia have been frightful so far this year. So I'm sure there are many locals loving the notion of it being wet, but driving a supercar, that adds to the complexity. This is car number 99 on screen here at the moment. 
And these young guys, Anton Di Pasquale and Will Brown, did an awesome job last year, parking themselves on the second row of the group at the start of the great race in their rookie campaign. They've both had exposure to the racetrack previously in support categories. And yesterday, Anton, in treacherous conditions, was able to sneak that car into the top 10. So we're going to see him later on today. Meantime, Cameron Waters is looking pretty speedy out there on what's been an interrupted weekend for him with some electrical dra dramas. And they had a crank trigger sensor problem earlier on. And the fact that he was only able to do five flying laps prior to going out and doing a time yesterday is, is just remarkable. So he's just done a 4-1. So there'll be a bit of uh, energy to expend in that car based on the amount of time that's been lacking because Michael Caruso also had an interruption in one of the sessions. Oh, was someone going into the sand there? It looked remotely like a, an off going in there. Well, that was the chain or is it Garth? Shane. There's about six or seven co-drivers in the cars at the moment. Shane backs it back down the escape road. He's at turn one. I think he went off there yesterday. In fact, I reckon in quali we saw him go off. By my count, it was three. Remember that Shane Van Gisbergen is now second in the championship. The cream rising to the top as he and his old rival, Scott McLaughlin, continue in this incredible arm wrestling battle that they've had in the recent past. And that'll be the tailwind that you spoke of. So it's, it's effectively straight in the back of the car to tailwind into turn one. So they'll be going faster into turn one. And that braking marker will move probably by a car length or so by four or five metres. James Hinchcliffe is at the wheel of car number 27 at the moment. We're riding with the Napa Auto Parts Australia entry. He made a little mistake on the run into the cutting before, and unfortunately, in that previous session, just damaged the right rear corner of the car, rubbed it up on the concrete. He's up at Forrest's elbow. And the mythology around some of the naming of the corners here, allegedly named after Jack way, Forrest, a way. bike racer who rubbed his elbow. That's a fair bit of turning angle there. I'm not sure that that's 100% true. There are one or two stories. There are fables that surround this place. There's been some amazing motor racing over many years here through a whole bunch of categories, including two and three wheels, with all that's gone on on four wheels over the years. It'd be an urban myth if it was urban. <laughs> it's not. Regional call myth. Regional it's myth. a regional myth. <laughs> There's probably some regional misses here as well. <laughs> exactly. Our fastest driver at the moment is Cam Waters. He's done a 2 minute 4.1. It's a 0 0.17 margin over Chaz Mostert. Anton Di Pasquale, we were monitoring before, is up in third spot. Mark Winterbottom in fourth, who's sharing the driver that he's previously won the race with in Stephen Richards. And they're making some driver change rehearsal opportunities down there in the Napa Auto Parts entry for Alexander Rossi now climbing on board. How interesting would this be? They don't do any other motor racing like this, do they? <laughs> this no, is none of that going on in no. an Indy car. <laughs> the things on the deck and the boys haven't got the belts on yet because honestly it is so hard. One of the hardest things of the weekend is the driver change. A really, really good one with no drama is about 15 Three or 16 seven. seconds without the heat of the battle. And it's the heat of the battle comment that you just made that's really the important one there, roading some brakes in the back of car 99. Coming off Actually, they might be just making a ride height change. I'll correct that. Uh, so in the car, still car number 99, Anthony Pasquale. And also roading some tyres. So you don't want to go into the weekend with too many shiny sets of tyres in case you're dealing with some weather. And that probably applies a little bit to the wets as well, although for tomorrow's forecast, it looks OK. I can't quit Chopper on the run down towards the fast right-hander at the bottom of the chase. Look at that corner originally put in there to slow the cars down. <laughs> that didn't work. It's an awesome shot through the chase out the other side. So that's the fastest corner in this country for motorsport, and one of the fastest in the world. When it was originally installed for 1987, which was a round of the World Touring Car Championship, you had to blaze down there, use a little apron on the left, grab the brake, save yourself, try and sneak around the corner. As the cars, the tyres, the suspension and everything else has evolved, it's a 100% flat throttle commitment through there. Mind you, the first laps, when you first arrive day one, you do have to think twice about whether or not you stay committed to the right foot down there. Totally. Well, you and I both drove this and GDRs here, and it was definitely not flat. It was basically the same straight line speed with almost no aero. And I'm still getting over it. <laughs> grey hairs. A lot of grey hair. Actually, it's blonde. <laughs> So turn two, 
and this great idea of the how narrow it is at the top here at turn three where you really cannot see into the cutting at all you've got to make a blind commitment into four right there on the right hand side is where james hinchcliffe just wiped the commodore on the wall in the previous session little fan of the throttle here and then recommit in third gear before you pull fourth as you crest the top of the hill metal great right here is where luke yulden clouded the wall earlier in the weekend watching that you don't fly on two wheels too much at mcphillamy and then it's just on 220 k's when you grab a gear over the top at skyline but be careful of locking that brake on the front left corner on the run through the s's and then there's a point even if you are not accurate and you're a couple of k's out of phase where you just throw it across the dipper exactly and then by the time you fire it down there you concentrate on the exit so much because where you just went into for Selbo is one of the best passing spots so you'll see that tomorrow the runoff the dipper is all important yesterday mclaughlin had a big whoops there a couple of times because water lays in against the gutter on the right hand side very easy to catch that standing water if it's wet and this is the corner fair way around the corner isn't it <laughs> long way around the corner and actually meeting the first brake marker before grabs the brake pedal and the significance of that is you've got to wait for the right front wheel to fully land before you can crank the brake pressure on. And if you do lock there, you'll probably carry it for the best part of a couple of hundred metres down to the corner. This is the final one where the brakes have got very hot, so front brakes are working overly hard, which excites the rear of the car into that left-hand cor uh, left corner at turn 23. Waters, who's fastest, is still in the lane. Moffat in car number 55, sharing with Chaz Most at fourth last year. Will Davison in position three sharing with his brother Alex Davison. They were quick in that previous session. The mobile one cars at the top of the hill. Scott Pye, James Courtney in two and 22 and James just rub it. I reckon he might have just taken it. The first, the top coat of paint off here. Oh, oh no, he got, got away with it. How close. What actually happens there is when you're behind another car, it makes it harder. So if the car in front is 10 or 15 centimetres away from the apex, you're 30 to 40 centimetres away. That was Jack Perkins in car number 22. He's been really ill. He's actually spent a day in hospital last week. He's got a big dose of influenza and not his normal effervescent self. 18 minutes remain in this practice session. The final practice session before the Armour All Top 10 shootout later on this afternoon. The order at the moment is Waters in the Mustang, Moffat in the Mustang, Davison in the Mustang. Anton Di Pasquale is the first of the Holdens in fourth position. Fastest Nissan at the moment is Gary Jacobson down in 14th in car three. Those Nissans have been very quick this weekend. At one point yesterday, we saw Andre Heingartner get into the threes in car number seven, which was very impressive. Yeah, they've been robbed a little bit. I think in the drive, probably Rick Kelly and Andre would have gotten to the 10. In the end, yesterday, Rick Kelly, who was up in fourth for a long period of provisional qualifying for our more qualifying that we're going to see that top 10. There's Betty Komenko and Daniel looking on, just checking their cars out. That is, bar none, the best spot to watch cars in Australia as they arrive down the hill into that dip. It is fantastic. Cars are doing 200k right in front of you. Meantime, at the bottom of the hill is the, the athlete side of the corner, David Reynolds and Will Brown. And they're watching their car on screen, so pretty good lap. Yeah, Betty and Daniel just watching up the top. This is a good lap so far for Anton. Fastest over the top at a 32.7 equals the record speed that McLaughlin did in 2017 in the top 10 shootout. We've seen good speed so far this weekend. We're anticipating what could be a record breaking top 10 shootout this afternoon for pace. Isn't that an awesome shot from behind the Ridges Hotel at the bottom of the chase for the Icon Quick Chopper? shows you the back of the paddock area where all the support categories are together with a lot of the camping area which continues to expand year on year here's a three i reckon it's a big chance for a three here oh just misses out a 405 so inaccurate mark you were five one hundreds out <laughs> but it's a good lap from young anton good job much better lap much better exit for the yellow much better run in the straight it'll be a sacrifice last corner but overall the exit was better so yeah not a bad lap uh, for those that are going to get into the Armour All Top 10 shootout, with coming up to about 15 minutes remaining in the session, it'll be time to think about a rehearsal. And if you're going to be true to yourself with the rehearsal, and you were religious in the way you went about doing this, you drive to the end of the pit lane, you go out there with the correct pressure in the tyres, and you start from a proper cold cycle, you give yourself the one warm-up lap as a lead-in, and then you pull the trigger. 
you can't go out there and do multiple laps and then kid yourself into thinking that, OK, that car balance is pretty good. Now, we think that maybe the case here for Cam Ward is the fact that he's even in the top 10 shootout, I still can't get over to go out onto that track yesterday with no run-up. I think he had five flying laps and then get it inside that group of cars. He's qualified eighth. It's amazing. So here's the run, 260-odd kilometres an hour on the run up the hill, depending on the tyre condition and the wind direction. Gravity helps enormously under brakes into there. It's a beautiful corner and it can be in favour of tucking the car in. But if you do run it wide, it can be a spooky ride. That was out of breath on the run up the hill then. Oh, that was close to the fence. He's got the lights on, which is a signal to the other drivers that he's simulating his lap. And the body language as he tosses it across the top of the hill is it's full commitment. Picking him up at McPhillamy. And the chopper gives you an idea of just the rise and fall and the sweeping elevation of this racetrack. He sneaks it back to the left side of the road, temporarily throws it up onto two wheels, doesn't block a break through the S's in the early part where Wincup and Stanaway came undone yesterday. And then this is the exit of the Dipper where he now grabs third gear and on the run down the hill gets back, believe it or not, to 180 kilometres an hour before he tucks it back to second gear for the left-hander at Forest Selbo. Made the Good numbers. too early. 32-6, he had to throw it in early, was Mark's background comment there. And the reason is if you arrive too quick at Forest Elbow, all you can do is sneak towards the apex of the corner and hope that it stays on line. It's hurt his exit a bit, Propo. It's a bit to see what the last sector is based on that. Because he had to come out of the throttle. He was out to the fence about a car length earlier than he would have liked. Nice flow through the change of direction at the left to right. Pick up the throttle a metre later coming out of Forest Elbow. Hurts your terminal speed at the other end of the straight. That's the significance of corner exit speed. Checking the number for you. Cam Waters is currently second. Make that P1, the first driver in the threes. He's done a two-minute 3.9. Tim Edwards in the background. And there's Michael Caruso, who's co-driving with him this weekend. This is the thing that you remarked on. Just having to turn it down a little bit earlier into the elbow. See, and he couldn't hold it in. And then it stayed yeah. high on the exit of the corner, Greg. Yeah, and Scott McLaughlin just came in a few minutes ago. They did a practice brake change. So they changed the rotor and the caliper all in one go on this car. Since then, they sat here and they made the modifications to the car. It was in race trim. And they've just taken all the cam... Oh, sorry, taken... Put a lot more camber on all the wheels getting ready for a quali sim. So a brand new set of tyres about to go on. They've been struggling a little bit here on the left front though for a little while. I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but he is now set up to do a sim. So guys, watch out for the 17 in a minute. Thanks, Greg. Nice to have you back on the ground, by the way. Doing your job there in the pit lane. So we'll keep an eye out on that lap for McLaughlin. So they've cranked on some more aggressive cambers on that car to make it turn better and maximise mid-corner grip. And they're prepared to sacrifice some temperature on the inside edge of the tyre and the extreme speeds they achieve in a straight line. Car number 23 is on screen here. And Will Davis and the Milwaukee Tools car has been quick all week. He'll be a threat this weekend for sure. He's driving with his brother Alex. He's fourth at the moment with a personal best in sector one. And he's just done a time that's only fraction slower than his best time so far. So great consistency. He just did a two minute 4.42. His best in the session is a 2 minute 4.40. We pick up on Fabian Coulthard, who was very disappointed for his qualifying from yesterday. Fabian will start the race in 16th position, but you detailed earlier that there's been a fair few people outside of the top 10 that have won this race in recent times, and that's not the end of the world for Fabian and Tony Dalberto. They form a pretty strong combination. But he'll be looking now to make that a nice race car. So he won't be worried about the one lap speed. He'll be making it nice and easy to drive. Consistent, flowing car with real rhythm will be the thing for Sunday. Continuity with the pairing with Tony Delberto. They're on the podium here two years ago. And other than qualifying, they've had a really strong run this weekend. But yesterday's conditions weren't conducive. Now, Andre Heimgartner, while we've been chatting and looking in other directions, has snuck into the top 10 with the Nissan. He's just done a 5 2. So different people, different programs. Some are running heavier cars, older tyres, still gathering data. Because the pressure is on and the pace is up, everybody looking carefully at fuel burn, at tyre wear and at brake wear. Now, on our estimate, fuel's up about 120 to 150 millilitres per lap, about half a can of coke per lap because of the lap speed. What's that number look like for Fabian? 5.7, so about three tenths of a second slower 
than the best number that he's achieved so far from a sector perspective. Cam Waters is the quickest car in all three sectors at the moment. And that has equated to a 2 minute 3.95 for him. So there's the confirmation of what Mark was just talking about. Those that have been able to come back and achieve the ultimate at this location from shocking positions on the grid. We get very excited about who does good laps and how far up the grid they start. But in the end, there's only one thing that counts, and that's the result sheet. And some of them have been able to make it work from them from horrid positions, Mark. Exactly. Yeah, I just want to show you down here. This is this brake pad change we're talking about, the brake rotor. So it's not compulsory to change the caliper and the rotor, but here's the complete assembly. So they pump it up. They actually have the pads already seated on the face of the disc, so it can go on as an assembly. They put the two bolts back in that they've removed for the caliper. That's one way to skin the cat. Very fast, very efficient. But if it goes wrong, which it did last year, because they preheat them, and sometimes you can't get the coupler to do up because it's too hot. Now, up the other end of the pit lane, I'll show you later, the other simpler way to do it, you saw how quick that is. So again, that's going to be a big item for finger trouble over the course of the weekend. Yeah, we'll watch it carefully. You and I, together with Greg, stood there yesterday and watched them rehearsing at Kelly Racing. And I had a clock on it, and they did wheel off, change the caliper and the brake rotor as one unit got the wheel back on. They did it in 18.7 seconds. Wow. It was fantastic. It's a good lap. It's his fastest first sector. It's slightly slower. It's only 200 slower. He's got he some traffic. Caught with one of the Erebus cars here. It's car Will he get out of the way? Yeah, I think he will. He'll pull to the right. I don't think that will have hurt him too much. He's one of the things that you just can't attack. He did have it on the wobble, didn't he, at the yeah, right-hander? It was unstable on the approach to the cutting. It was David Reynolds in car nine who paid him the courtesy to hop out of the way. Did it have an effect? It was the best number that we've seen over the top of the hill and the personal best for that first sector. So a 32.6 for him in the mid-sector as he sizes up the chase. He's got a bit more traffic down the bottom here as well, but hopefully it doesn't impact. It creeps it all the way back to the right-hand side of the road before he turns it in. It. Stays clear of the curve. That may not have been intentional. Just missed the left-hand apex by about 300 mil by about a tyre width. And makes a brake bias adjustment on the run into the final corner as well. And it just oversees, steers ever so slightly in second gear and he moves it up into second. He gets into the threes though. So he's three one hundred slower than Cam Waters. So there are a couple of little things that were ragged on that lap as we go back and find 99. Anton Di Pasquale is in third spot, and there's nothing between the top three at the moment. In fact, you could call it the top four. Exactly. Point one is the separation of those top three cars. 398 plays his 348 from yesterday. So I, I think that's genuine. I reckon that's half a second slower than yesterday based on the track condition with the rain that we had overnight. And the wind direction. And the wind direction. So Thomas Randall, rookie for the Bathurst 1000 this weekend, sharing with Lee Holdsworth, who's been on the podium here back in 2009. Busy weekend for Thomas. Keyboard for us last night. He's a classical seven, pianist, seven, among other things. He's also a very successful young racing driver. We're going to see a lot more of him. They've been very quick with that car this weekend, but they had a difficult qualifying yesterday. They couldn't get it to hook up, couldn't get the tyres to work in those cold, wet conditions. Got just inside seven minutes remaining now for this final practice session before the Armour All Top 10 shootout later in the day. Van Gisbergen really pushing on hard. So a little bit of inside front locking on the front left-hand corner on the run into Forest Elbow as we track down the straight. Is the small direction change at the top of the hill shortly grabs sixth gear and builds that speed. You can see the data on the right-hand side of the screen. There's a bit more breeze around out there today. Sneaks it back out to that apron. There's the chopper in the background doing all the tracking. And where is he sitting at the moment in the order? He's down in 17th position, but it's a personal best in Sector 1. He's done a 33-4 in Sector 2, so he's actually given quite a chuck away. In fact, it's an in lap for him. He's sharing with Garth Tander, and it's a new partnership. Massive amount of experience there. Garth's had three victories here, but Shane's still in search of his first. He probably should have cleaned up in 2014, but the racing gods were not with him on that occasion. And he's had some very strong campaigns here over the years, and big expectation that he'll be strong tomorrow, Larko. 
Well, as you know, Neil, we're celebrating 50 years of holding factory teams here at Bathurst this weekend. And a guy I needed to find just quickly was Colin Bond. He was there at the start. You're part of the DNA, mate, that is in the asphalt beneath us. But let me ask you, Colin, in all of those years, you won in that Monaro that we've seen uh, Craig Lance run around in. What's changed the most in your eyes? Oh, I think basically because they were stock standard motor cars we were racing then. And the cars now are very highly modified. So I had to sort of contemplate our cars were driven up from Melbourne, you know, to the racetrack. The boys drove them up. They were registered, trade registered. So, you know, and the track was much different, of course. You know, the straight was dead straight. Barbed wire fences down the straight. There were no sort of safety barriers anywhere. But I must admit, 50 years, technology's taken over. And uh, obviously, things are much safer. Cars are much faster, of course. And it's just all to do with money and technology. <laughs> Can I say thank you for your contribution, mate, over those 50 years, and it's just magnificent to see you down here on the pit lane with us. Thanks, Bondi. Not a problem, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Marco. And Bondi okay. is in the garage there for Irwin Racing and supporting Mark Winterbottom and Stephen Richards this weekend and his friend Charlie Swerkholp. Three-time Australian Rally Champion. He was the 1975 Australian Touring Car Champion. He was the winner here in 1969, as Mark Larkham described, and runner-up famously in 1977 with Alan Moffat. And we should take pause for a moment uh, to pay respect to Peter Malloy and his family, sadly. Peter, who was a huge part of the background story in this motor racing yesteryear, and part of that one-two effort for Ford in the late 70s, lost his life in a battle with illness in the recent past. And I know he provided engine support to Mark Larkin at one stage. He did with us at Coca-Cola Racing with Wayne Gardner. Uh, he's a big contributor in the open wheel Formula 5000 era, and sadly we lost Peter earlier this week. So our thoughts are with his family, a huge name in the background in this event. One of the most famous engine builders in the history of Australian motorsport. Certainly did a great job in those days with the factory Ford team. And what a result. There was a famous win, 1977, Moffat and Bond 1-2. Probably one of the most famous images of all time. Murph? 97 is uh, still in the garage. They have not done a run on new tyre yet, boys. They haven't done a sim. They've just made another change. Dampers from the rear of this car. Uh, the Triple Eight car is out on a green set, the first ones that they've been on. Scott McLaughlin's car rolled in here a second ago. No changes, just another set of tyres. Nothing else done to that car, and it rolled. So a lot of cars out there at the moment on their final sim for the shootout. It's interesting that they're playing still with things that would be substantial when you've got bits out of it like that late in the game. But obviously, that'll either be because Shane's not 100% happy or they've actually got something they want to test for, for quality, you know, that it makes it more of a qualifying car. Blue and yellow, just to the pits behind you. Front straight is clear for me now. So... closely followed by... Blue and the reason why Grant McPherson is giving Shane all that information is he wants him to stay off the back of Simona, who's the next in the queue in front of him up round turn two, but he wants him to stay clear, Shane that is, of McLaughlin and Heimgartner and others that are behind. So this will be something of a rehearsal for him. Remember that he qualified third yesterday in a great drive in really difficult conditions. And we've seen some spectacular driving over the years from Van Gisbergen in those kinds of conditions. Meantime, at the top of the hill, we know that Nick Perkat, who's also in the Armour All Top 10 shootout later today, is having a crack here in car number eight. He's done a personal best in the first sector, the 7-Eleven mobile car, right at Skyline. He did a nice job there. That was a really nice brake modulation and slide over Skyline and had it tucked nicely to the right through the S's. So absolutely on the textbook line over the top of the hill. It slides a little in the rear, but he still got it back to the full right-hand side of the road when he turned it in at Forest Elbow. Now McLaughlin's on a brilliant lap. Fastest first sector as Cam Waters is about to finish what could be an even stronger lap. He was on a 3.9, but he just missed out beating himself by the tiniest of margins. Will Davison just jumped up into fourth position. So that was a four flat near enough for Waters. It was only a whisker slower than his own fastest time. Check this one out though. McLaughlin's got the best number we've seen in the first sector. And remember, he made a little mistake. Just have a listen. He made a little mistake at the left-hander. Right here on the last one. Can he get it stopped? Couldn't really see the apex with that shot, but I reckon he had the flow of it a little better. He makes the change of direction. This is going to be a great lap. This might be a number to go under Waters. 3.7 or 3.8. 
369. Well done, Scott McLaughlin. Nice lap. So that's a rehearsal. Nice work, mate. That was, uh, wasn't ideal conditions to practice that, but really good job. P1, two and a half tenths. So a two-minute 3.69. Here comes Moss For a quarter of a really second gap over Cam Waters. So 3.6 plays 3.9. Deeper Squally on a 4.0. Moss to Mark's point. The fastest in sectors one and two. In the braking area at the bottom of the chase. This might knock them all off. He uses a bit more kerb on the left-hand side than those that we've observed in the recent past. And he sits it up on the kerb on the exit at the second last corner. If he pulls it up squarely here, this might get under the 3-6. Doesn't use kerb at the final corner. Here we go. But he does on the exit, and it goes to the top. <laughs> it's a two-minute 3.5 for Chas Mostert. Great lap, buddy. Nice <laughs> it's a great lap. Uh, 21, 2 10, 10 o'clock. Good job. Wow, so awesome. how tight? Got 0.18 of a second margin between Chaz and McLaughlin. And James Moffat, his co-driver, was watching in the background. Adam DeBore immediately jumped on the radio and said, nice job, well done. So the flag is now out. There are still a heap of people out there to complete their laps. Shane Van Gisbergen, one of them. Here he is at the dipper. Remember, they made a change to this car and they bolted on some fresh Dunlop rubber. He's sitting down in 22nd. Is traffic a factor? He was just teetering on the notion of sliding in the rear as he came off the elbow. And the shell car, which was McLaughlin, gives him plenty of space on exit. So what a game we've got for this afternoon. Because we thought McLaughlin had free reign on dry weather speed. That's certainly not the case. Mostert almost makes the 3 4 8 that. McLaughlin did yesterday. He does a 3-5-0. He's almost two tenths of a second faster than Scott McLaughlin in the same conditions. We cut, we missed him. He went to fifth. What does Van Gisbergen do here? He'll come right up there somewhere. In fact, he goes up to fourth to be the first holder. Nice job, Chad Van Gisbergen. A four dead. It's a very good time. So he's 0.49 slower than Mostert. Working pretty hard. He, he's got the puff on. Didn't actually catch his comment in the background on the radio. So, Mostert, McLaughlin, Waters, Van Gisbergen, Deeper Squally, Wind Cup, Davison, Winterbottom, and Randall. The results confirmed for you on screen. Practice number seven. Originally slated for the co drivers, but it opened up earlier in this week for all to participate. And a rehearsal for those that are going to participate in the Armour All Top 10 shootout later on today. And for those on the other side of that equation, really refining their race cars and a very important opportunity to be able to make sure that they are perfectly trimmed to go into 161 laps of racing for what's potentially going to be one of the fastest races in history tomorrow. Beautiful scenes looking over the top of the mountain. Weather holding off at the moment. Bureau was saying that from about 15 minutes from now is when the possibility of light showers could be a factor. Keep an eye on that for the rest of the day. Just doing the numbers, that 32.56 middle sector, so it's really the one across the top of the hill, that's the fastest middle sector ever for Mostert. Yesterday it was a 32.59 for McLaughlin. That Mostert mid sector, which we always talk about the bravery and commitment required to get across the top, that's the fastest ever. James Courtney, unfortunately not making the top 10 shootout yesterday. What is your plan for this afternoon? I wouldn't mind going up the, t uh, the hill and having a few beers with the lads up there. It would be good, but uh, unfortunately we're not allowed to. So, uh, I don't know, we're finished now, so we'll probably have a strategy meeting, go over what we just did then, and uh, then head home. Nice early one. So I uh, might watch it back at the house. There are a couple of question marks around your co-driver, Jack Perkins. Not feeling all the best. How is he so far today? There's always question marks around Jack. But, uh, no, he's, he's much better today. Um, you know, we just didn't want to run the risk of running him in the 250k race today and then him being knackered for tomorrow. So, uh, so yeah, the call was made. Tough one for him. And, and uh, sorry to Eggleston Motorsport for those guys. They're uh, left with a car sitting here. But um, unfortunately, uh, the team pulled rank. So, it's uh, yeah, he'll be right. He'll be good tomorrow. He's a trooper and uh, we'll be fine. Thanks, JC. Cheers. Well, only a couple of hundreds off what uh, Scott did yesterday. The fastest ever middle sector across the top of the mountain, mate. How was that? You're not breathing too heavy, so you're quite calm. Yeah, um, 
Thanks, mate. Uh, yeah, uh, for me, the car kept getting better. I think just learning how to drive it and get the most out of it was the biggest thing. So, um, yeah, I think we've been working hard on the car in practice. It, it feels probably a bit better on fuller tanks than what it does light tanks. So I'm hoping that we've got a better race car than qualifying car, but just awesome to do a three. So, I'm, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. It's the fastest you've ever been around here, mate. I think that's a pretty good qualifying car. Yeah, it is. It's actually, I'm, I'm probably very lucky I get to do some BMW laps in the GT3 across here. I think that's helped a lot with, um, you know, the supercars getting faster and faster over the years. So uh, even though, you, you you know, you're puckering up across the top, you know, you've, you've been that fast across the top in a different car before as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, I don't want to jinx it, but we're going pretty good at the moment. And, um, yeah, if we can qualify in the front couple of rows, we'll try. But, you know, the guy next door, he's, he's been the qualifying king this year. And to knock him off will be hard. But, like I said, if we can just qualify at the front, there's a long race. It's going to be an awesome armour all shootout this afternoon. Thanks very much. So as they're just getting ready to push the uh, number nine Penrite Racing Commodore into the garage, Luke Gilden, one of the great advantages, and here's your driver here, your main driver as well. Uh, come and join us, Davey. One of the great advantages you guys have, I know you're not happy with 22nd starting there, but I just saw a lot of people... What advantage, <laughs> what advantage have we got? Well, I'll tell you the advantage. I watch a lot of people focusing then on one lap, right, trying to get this qualifying thing. You guys, Luke, you just told me you did a race run. It was good. Yeah, we did one this morning as well, so we've, we've done a, a few long runs now. Obviously, the car is basically in race spec, so as you said, we don't have to think about quali cambers and all that sort of stuff. We can just concentrate on the race car, and it's been quite beneficial in that regard. We've made a couple of tweaks, so uh, I think we're looking pretty strong. Davey, I know you'll be gutted not to be in the 10, but what's your approach now? Have you just re said, OK, it's just a race now that we can attack it differently? Um, well, yeah, we just might have to play a bit uh, off strategy and just, you know... Be a bit risky, I reckon, passing people, but be selective on who you're risky against. And um, actually, looking forward to the challenge. It's going to be a bit of fun. So that says you've just got out of the car. Clearly, you're happy with the car. Then that's an important part. Yeah, I think I was happy this morning. We made we made some we made some changes that was, you know, probably hurt the tyres a bit over the distance. So, um, you know, we've probably got to go back to what we have and also tune it up to to be faster. But yeah, like yeah, it's it's going to be good, don't worry. All right, thanks for the chat, boys. Appreciate it. Jay Kaseka, you guys are having a really tough start to this wildcard weekend. Missed out on that practice session, another issue with the car. Yeah, it seems to be we have a power steering pump issue, but um, it's better happening today than in the big race tomorrow, but I'm sure we're going to fix it up straight away and get, get back out there for tomorrow. How much do you think missing out on these practice sessions is going to affect you in the long race tomorrow? Yeah, it is crucial, these sessions, since we're making our debut, our team as well, so we're all, we're all pretty fresh. Um, tomorrow's a long race, so... It sort of helps us in that sense. Thanks, Jake. Thank you.